Commercial real estate loans are very different than residential home loans and the terms of these deals can be a lot more complex. And one of the biggest differences on the commercial side of the industry is that the amortization period of these loans tends to be different than the loan term itself, which can have some really meaningful impacts on the economics of a deal. So to make sure you know both what these differences are and the effects that these differences can have on an investment, this video walks through the amortization period and the loan term in commercial real estate in detail and the impacts of changes to each of these on both a lender and a borrower. So to start this video off, we first need to define what the amortization period and the loan term are. And to start with the amortization period first, this represents the length of time that's used to calculate fixed monthly loan payments that would pay off the loan in full. This means that if you have a 30 year amortization period, this is going to be what's used to calculate your monthly loan payments throughout the loan term, assuming you'd make equal monthly installments over that 30 year period. But in commercial real estate, where things start to get tricky is that in the vast majority of cases, lenders are going to want their full outstanding loan amount back in just a three to 10 year period, rather than a full 30 years like you might see on a residential home loan. And this means that on a commercial real estate loan, you might have an amortization period of 30 years, but a loan term of only five years, for example, which means those monthly payments are going to stop at the end of that five year period. And the entire outstanding loan balance at that time is going to need to be paid off in full in what's often referred to in this industry as a balloon payment. And because these balloon payments can be so big and often require either a refinance or sale of the property just to make the lender whole, this often leads to the question, why would a borrower and a lender choose to extend the amortization period beyond the loan term? Well, first, from a borrower's perspective, matching the amortization period to just a five, seven, or 10 year loan term will often result in a huge strain on operating cash flow and can often even require additional equity investments just to pay the lender. And to use an example here, if we were to look at a property acquired for $10 million at a 6% cap rate, we generate $600,000 of net operating income in year one of our ownership period. But if we also say that this property is financed with a 60% LTV loan at a 6% interest rate with a loan term of five years and an amortization period that's also five years, our annual debt service requirements on this loan would be almost $1.4 million, meaning that the NOI our property can generate wouldn't even come close to covering these costs and investors would need to come out of pocket with the remaining $791,000 per year required just to service the debt. And in this scenario, it really wouldn't make sense for investors to borrow, and it also wouldn't make sense for a lender to lend. So to incentivize lending activity on commercial real estate transactions, this is where lengthening that amortization period can start to come into play. And in this case, if we were to keep our loan term at five years, but lengthen our amortization period to 30 years this time, now our annual debt service requirements drop by almost 70% from almost $1.4 million a year to just over $431,000 a year, which ends up having benefits on both sides of the equation. From a borrower's perspective, obviously this decreases their monthly debt service requirements, which not only reduces the amount of equity they may need to raise to fund a deal over time, but this also increases the cash flow available to distribute to investors on a monthly or quarterly basis. And from a lender's perspective, this is also a benefit because not only does this reduce the borrower's default risk during that loan term, but this also increases the total interest they can expect to collect all else being equal. And to show this, using that same example we've been working with, in the five-year amortization scenario, the lender on the deal would earn just over $959,000 in interest payments over that five-year term, which represents about 16% of their initial loan funding. But in the 30-year amortization scenario, that same lender could expect to earn over $1.7 million during that same five-year loan term, which represents over 29% of their original capital investment. 
Now, with all of that said, even though a longer amortization period can be beneficial to both the lender and the borrower on a deal, this can also end up creating issues because with a longer amortization period also comes a bigger balloon payment at the end of that loan term. Using our example, in the five year amortization period scenario where that monthly payment is the highest, that outstanding loan balance at the end of the loan term is also going to be zero just because those monthly loan payments are going to make sure that loan is paid off in full at the end of five years. But in the 30 year amortization scenario, over $5.5 million of loan proceeds are going to remain at the end of that term and will need to ultimately be paid off in one lump sum. Now, if the value of the property has increased and interest rates have also stayed the same or even decreased over the loan term, this usually won't be a problem and the borrower can either refinance the property or sell the property outright to come up with that balloon payment. But where things can start to get tricky is when the value of the property has dropped or interest rates have actually increased over the loan term, since in these cases, the borrower usually won't want to sell, but also can't easily refinance. And going back to our original example, let's say that at the end of our five-year loan term, property values have dropped in the market by 20% from the time these loan proceeds were initially funded, making the current market value of the property just $8 million. And in this case, the borrower isn't going to want to sell at that price point and lock in a $2 million loss that represents 50% of their initial equity investment. But if they want to refinance and hold on to the deal long term, they might have to raise additional equity just to make that happen. At an $8 million valuation, the same 60% LTV ratio would now produce a loan amount of just $4.8 million, which would be almost $800,000 short of what's going to be required to pay off that existing loan in the 30-year amortization scenario, meaning that the borrower would need to raise additional equity to make up the difference and just pay off the existing loan. And when this happens on a widespread basis, like we're starting to see today, this is why what's being referred to as the upcoming wall of maturities in commercial real estate is getting so much attention because there are a lot of properties today that aren't worth what they were just three to five years ago. And at the same time, interest rates have almost doubled since these loans were initially funded. And this is a prime example of why although a longer amortization period or even a long-term interest only period where only interest payments need to be made can be attractive as a borrower, these things do increase refinance risk at the end of the loan term. And this is definitely something worth thinking about when structuring these deals. So I hope this was helpful to give you a better sense of what the difference is between the amortization period and the loan term on a commercial real estate loan. And if you wanna learn more about other loan terms you need to know when getting into commercial real estate, and you wanna learn how to model these terms in Excel when analyzing deals, make sure to check out our all-in-one membership training platform, Breaking the CRE Academy. A membership to the Academy will give you instant access to over 120 hours of video training on real estate financial modeling and analysis. You'll get access to hundreds of practice Excel interview exam questions, sample acquisition case studies, and you'll also get access to the break into CRE analyst certification exam, which covers topics like real estate pro forma and development modeling, commercial real estate lease modeling, equity waterfall modeling, and many other real estate financial analysis concepts that will help you prove to employers that you have what it takes to tackle the responsibility of an analyst or associate at a top real estate firm. And if you like this video and want to see more content on the channel on commercial real estate loans, make sure to hit the like button and let me know. And let me know in the comments what other specific loan terms or other types of commercial real estate debt you'd like to see covered in a future video on the channel. As always, thanks so much for watching, guys. I hope you found this helpful. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already to see more videos like this every single week. And I'll see you in the next video.